Do I just use the laptop, or is there a thing to move the slides? You can, uh, oh, that's uh, right. That it's, uh, Okay, so I would like to uh, introduce the third and final speaker of this session. So, uh, Sophie Armanini is the third speaker. Uh, she graduated last year at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering at the Technical University of Munich uh, last year. She currently is a first year PhD student uh, uh, here in Delft and she's working on system identification and the modeling of a flapping wing flight. And the topic of her research is the Delft fly. So, Sophie, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. So, um, I'd like to talk about some about a set of flight tests we conducted with the Delfly, which is the the flapping wing MAV developed here at the TU Delft. And the purpose of these tests was to determine trim curves and a number of other basic flight properties. And this was partly preliminary work for the modeling and system identification we're doing, and partly simply to investigate some of the properties of the Delphi. So, yeah, this is the basic outline I'll follow. So I'll uh, start with a very quick introduction to flapping wing flight and then say something about the experimental setup we used and uh, the tests we conducted. Okay, so flapping wing flyers flap their wings to generate lift and thrust. And uh, due to this particular mechanism, they possess a number of desirable flight properties. So they tend to be highly maneuverable and agile. They can typically hover, fly at very low speeds. Sometimes they can even fly backwards. And so due to all of these favorable properties, there is currently a widespread interest in developing flapping wing MAVs. At the TU Delft, this, um, this type of research into flapping wing flight has led to the development of the Delft fly, which um, I think most of you are probably familiar with, but for those who are not, this is the Delphi. It is uh, modeled on a dragonfly, and its wings are arranged in an X configuration. Uh, actually, several different types of slightly different Delphis exist, but the one that we used has a um, wingspan of 29 centimeters and weighs about 22 grams, and it is controlled by means of elevator and aileron deflections as well as by means of the flapping frequency. So this was the subject of these tests. And the aim of these tests was, as I said, to quantify a number of steady state flight properties. And uh, this was a, yes, to quantify a number of steady state flight properties to be used in current and future modeling and simulation work. And uh, two particular applications we had in mind were um, firstly, to contribute to ongoing work in system identification and modeling, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment, and also to allow for the development of simulation frameworks. Um, actually, at the moment, we have very little in the way of simulation for the Delphi, so this was also a, another application we envisaged. And in addition, on a more general level, perhaps, the idea was also to obtain further insight into the flight testing of MAVs, which is still a relatively new field. So we hope to identify some of the important factors to keep in mind when flight testing uh, such vehicles. So as I said, one of the purposes was to contribute and to aid current um, modeling and system identification work. and. Uh, the reason for this is that at the moment we're using uh, largely steady aerodynamic models and uh, generally linear approaches. And so for these types of models, we need trim parameters. Uh, we need, for instance, to collect data around specific points. So we need to be able to um, conduct repeatable flight tests. And in order to obtain useful models that can actually be used, um, we also require trim points and trim parameters. 
So this was one of the uh, main motivations behind these tests. Okay, so I'll say something about the experimental setup we used. The flight tests were conducted in the TU Delft flight arena, the CyberZoo. Uh, the CyberZoo is an optical motion tracking facility. It is equipped with uh, 24 cameras that uh, reconstruct the position and attitude of objects within the arena that are equipped with, uh, with markers, with retroreflective or LED markers. And uh, the tracking system can reach sub-millimeter precision and um, provides data at a frequency of up to 120 hertz. For this particular set of tests, we used LED markers, and uh, these were affixed to the Delphi in the positions shown in the image. In addition to optical tracking data, we also required some form of control input measurement. And uh, since the experimental setup we used and the number of LED markers didn't allow for accurate measurement of control surface deflections, we decided to instead use the, command, the commands given by the pilot uh, by means of the transmitter. So that was the, the input measurement we used. And in a, in a way, it could also be argued that effectively the pilot controls the command and not the deflection. So this type of, uh, this type of formulation is also interesting uh, in its own accord. Although, of course, eventually we do want to consider the, the actual deflections. Okay, and before I go into the actual tests we conducted, uh, these are a number of considerations we, we, found, uh, we found it was uh, useful to keep in mind when flight testing uh, MAVs. And um, yeah, some of these we actually only found uh, during the testing process. But um, so the, an obvious point is that MAVs by definition are very small and light. So any slight change to their structure can have a very significant effect on their flight properties. And uh, this is especially a problem for fragile platforms like the Delphi, which are very easily damaged, even by standard maintenance or reparation work. And, and this can be a problem because it becomes difficult to compare the data gathered in separate flights. And along the same lines, attaching markers to a very small and light platform also affects uh, or also can affect the flight behavior. So we can only use very small markers, which are less accurate, and we can only use limited number, numbers of markers. Uh, finally, using optical tracking data, we have to ensure that the tracking performance is adequate. And there are several points to consider here, but one very obvious point is that um, actually the lighting conditions have a, can have a very big effect and can, use, can lead to uh, virtually useless data. So this is another point to keep in mind. And a, a very trivial point, but one that can have a significant effect, is the inherent limitation of size. So obviously a, a tracking chamber has a limited size, and in our case this meant that certain flight conditions couldn't be, um, couldn't be analyzed because there simply wasn't enough space and the vehicle would have crashed almost immediately. So these are some points that uh, should be kept in mind. Right. Um, the first test we conducted was aimed at determining longitudinal trim points, so trim conditions and the control inputs required to attain and maintain these conditions. And as a clarification, of course, a flapping wing vehicle, strictly speaking, is never in a steady condition. So what we mean is simply that uh, in a flap average sense, it is in a steady condition, so it oscillates about a constant average. And we defined trimmed conditions in terms of pitch attitude and uh, in-plane velocity. And the testing process, well, simply consisted in, using, uh, in fixing the elevator at different deflections and um, using the throttle to maintain a steady condition and looking at the, at the resulting flight conditions. Now, the main results we obtained are summarized here. These uh, plots show the relationship between the elevator command and the resulting velocity and pitch attitude. And what we see is, is not unexpected. 
uh, of course, an upward deflection of the elevator leads to a higher pitch attitude and a lower flight velocity. But what we wanted to know was the was what we wanted was to quantify these relationships, which is uh, what we did. And um, we also see that the relationships are approximately linear, although of course we would need further tests to uh, to corroborate this and to verify this. But we already have a um, have a relationship between control input and resulting conditions, which is one of the things we needed for our modeling work. And also, the obtained data provides, as um, as we wanted, a relationship between steady state velocity and pitch attitude. And the obtained trimmed points are shown here. And again, of course, a high velocity implies a lower pitch attitude which is as expected. The uh, second set of tests consisted in uh, evaluating steady turn behavior. And specifically, we looked at uh, the effect of different aileron deflections on the resulting turns, on the resulting turn radius and uh, turn rate. And for this, we simply started in any particular steady flight condition and applied different aileron inputs, looked at the effect. And um, to determine the trim radius, we uh, used a, a least squares approach to fit a circle to the, the measured flight trajectory, which uh, we found worked quite well. And the results, again, as expected, a larger aileron input leads to tighter and quicker turns. However, in this case, we do still recognize a somewhat linear trend, but there is a lot of scatter. And um, partly this was due to problems we had in the testing process. We had, um, we had some tracking problems, so um, the data was actually of quite a low quality. So there were some problems, and which is why for these tests in particular, we need further data to, uh, to verify what we currently have. So the tests we conducted give us an overview of trim conditions and uh, trim curves over a part of the flight envelope of the Delphi, and also an overview of steady turn behavior, as well as some experience and insight into the flight testing of MAVs. And the main utility, the main use we can make of these results is within modeling work that we're conducting. Uh, so as I said, these uh, trim curves are particularly useful for linear modeling um, approaches. And also, we can use this data to develop uh, simulation frameworks. Of course, before we can do that, we need to collect more flight data and uh, also to check that what we have now is, um, uh, is actually right. And uh, so that involves conducting more tests, and in particular, extending the current results to a larger part of the flight envelope, if possible, and perhaps looking at further flight conditions, such as uh, climb and, uh, and so on. And that brings me to the end. So uh, thank you. We have quite some time for questions, so uh, go ahead. Irian. Uh, actually, the previous flights that were conducted were conducted with a different type of Delphi, so the comparison is a bit limited. Um, yes, so and also they had um, they were different types of tests, so most of them involved uh, quick maneuvers, so maneuvers for system identification. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how much we can compare, but. Uh, yeah. Um. When you're conducting the 
test, does it matter if the inputs are being done by by controller or is it a pilot actually doing the inputs? It's a, so in these tests it was a pilot. It was a manual manual input. Okay. So yeah. will that make a difference when you're doing the modeling and plotting the results? Um I think it wouldn't really matter, depending on how the autopilot works, of course, but if it's just used to apply the inputs, then it should basically lead to the same type of results. More questions for Sophie? Guido. What, uh, what do they mainly use the results? <laughs> yes, so... Um, as I, as I mentioned, one use is within system identification work. So we used a, we, we did some work using linear models, which are valid only about around certain points. And so to use these models, we need to know where these points are and how we get, how we obtain these points, and also to collect data for this. So that's one use. And of course, we can, <coughs> as I said, we can also use the results for things like simulation. Um, frameworks. Um, I think those are the main uses. Yeah. So I have a question about the repeatability of the results that you got. So yes. uh, do you get the same trim curves uh, when you test a different day, so the next day or at different conditions? Uh, sometimes. Um, <laughs> so yeah, one of, the, one of the problems, as I said, is that uh, any slight change to the to the platform can have an effect. So if between two flights something happens, like a crash or even a, some piece of the structure coming undone and being glued back on, uh, so any little change can have an effect. So in that sense, um, we hope that results stay similar, but they do tend to change more than we want them to. And did you do some kind of uh, sensitivity analysis on this? So what uh, what failures cause the most yeah, differences in the trim curves. Or are you um, planning uh, to do that? <laughs> we we didn't um, systematically do that. So what we know is from just uh, experience from flying. But um, yeah, I think that's something we could do. But, but from experience, can you say something uh, about this? So uh, well, I mean, the larger the change, the larger the effects. So of course, if the uh, Delft flight crashes and breaks into five pieces, then it tends to have a big effect. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's, but yeah, that's something we could look into more. Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, let's thank the speaker again.